What if you knew everything mankind knew about the future? That'd be pretty neat. Um, so I'm Christopher Alberg. Um, grew up in Sweden, came to Boston in 97, and uh, built one company called Spotfire that did visualization of data. And uh, now we're trying to do sort of similar ideas, but trying to use the internet as a data source. And today I'll talk a little bit about how you can do that and, and apply that to some interesting applications. Um, so um, many times when things happen, we have this sort of sense that they happen out of the blue, just like bang. You know, you can blue can make it sound nice. Sometimes it's not so nice. So last week in Benghazi, uh, on September 11th, uh, the, the consulate, the American consulate, was attacked, and, and uh, some pretty nasty things went down. And you know, all kinds of discussions going on right now. Was this planned? Was this not planned? Uh, I sort of actually think that discussion is pretty stupid, because I don't think there will ever be an answer to that. The more interesting thing would have been, could we have actually predicted that this was going to happen and taken some precautions? Nobody seems to be saying that point. And that, I think, is about 100 times more interesting. Um, so, and I assume you're all sort of up to date on this. So we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit. Um, so you sort of start asking yourself the question, can we predict things in general? And, and uh, you know, there are things that we feel that sometimes we can predict, the weather, you know, and sometimes it feels like we can't. Um, what I'll be talking about is trying to think about how we can use the internet as a data source for doing predictions. And you've probably seen some of these nice things that people have done. Uh, Hal Varian and the guys at Google has done some terrific stuff with Google Flu Trends. I assume this, many of you have, have seen that. And I must say that's just very, very compelling. You know, look at the search terms that people are typing in. You know, I need to go to the doctor, I have a cough, sort of thing. And then actually aggregate that data at scale. And then not only at, for the whole country saying whether there's flus going on, but actually down to pretty specific places. That's pretty amazing. And, beating the traditional CDC models and so on. That's pretty compelling and uh, maybe a little bit less sort of uh, serious uh, subject matter, but looking at Twitter buzz to actually do all kinds of different things. But one of those sort of interesting experiments that keep coming up is sort of predicting whether a movie is going to have a great day or a great weekend at the box office or uh, similar to the, to the flu trends looking at uh, you know, how people say, I need to find the employment office, these sort of things, and, and say things about unemployment rates, and in fact, about a lot of econom economic metrics. Or um, here is something, an interesting area where trying to look not at search terms, but actually looking at news and text on the internet and aggregating what companies are being talked about and how they're being talked about, and use that to predict stock returns and stock volatility. So, there seems to be something interesting about actually being able to extract signals out of the internet. And that's what we've set out to do at Recorded Future, and I'll try to sort of tell you a little bit about the, I don't know what I want to call it, the science behind it. We didn't do any of this in academic setting, but we can still sort of think about it that way. Um, so big data and, and, and unrest is where we'll start. And for some reason, I've sort of just had to, thinking the last couple of years a lot about unrest. So. Uh, I think it's going to get pretty nasty out there. Uh, I had this sort of interesting experience on that day of September 11th here, you know, a couple of days ago or last week. This friend of mine, Eli, he sends me an email early, early that morning that says, we're now one year away from global riots, complex th system theorists say. I was like, and this was actually before the news of the Benghazi thing hit. So I was like, came back to him a couple of hours later and said, like, What's, you know, were you the instigator here? It was my, my sort of joke. But, um, and it turns out that if you look at food prices over this de last decade here, there's been sort of interesting data here, just you know, looking at how food prices rose. And for those of you who are trading food op uh, uh, futures here, you have probably had an nasty experience here. And then how food prices have come up again. And then you correlate that to unrest when food prices get high, people get angry. Sort of a nice backdrop to this, nice sort of at least uh, data-wise. And, and it's no surprise if you got really hungry and you got no food, you'd be angry. And, and uh, so this is not the big data piece. This is probably the very small data piece at some level. But I think it's an interesting sort of thing to have as a background, background that when people get hungry, they do get angry. And all kinds of things could happen. Now, in fact, so if we think again about this Benghazi sort of thing that we saw here, um, even it's like 
this is a sort of a random example, but 21st of August 2012, in Al Jazeera, food riots predicted over US crop failure. So in the days leading up to what was going on in Libya, and in actually not just in Libya, it was a whole bunch of places around there, people were sort of getting very nervous about this. Now, that's sort of the top-down view still. You could pick up all kinds of interesting little signals of, of, of people on social media doing all kinds of interesting sort of rioting activity regarding or related to Libya. Let me just skip one. There was like a big religious monument that took a beating in Maghazi, uh, you know, protest tomorrow outside the Egyptian embassy in, in Tripoli. And, and if, in fact, if you look at this data from sort of early July up until the very days before what happened in Benghazi, there were multiple sort of serious peaks here and people being on online media and, and being, you know, basically instigating riots. And, and you could see maybe some interesting patterns about retweetings of, of not just people talking about this, but people sort of building up an, an anger around this. So I think the sort of the, the, the first point that I want to make here today is that there were plenty of signals leading up to this. Not pinpointing that something might happen at exactly this consulate here, but if you're sort of responsible for State Department security, there were plenty of things to be looked at here and actually have, have done something about. And this is not just what's happening, you know, happened up until this point. There is plenty more being planned. And we'll, this is what we'll now dive into here, where there is like loads of these sort of unrest signals out there in the world. Now, it's easy to sort of after the fact go out and sort of find individual data points and lay them out all, and lay them all out and say, yeah, this was, of course, I, you know, totally clear. And why the heck didn't you find that in advance? And then you should point at me and say, why didn't you find that in advance? Uh, so, so that's easy. Um, and you think about the web being this sort of, at some level, potentially great source of, of data to sort of go after here. But the web is pretty damn complicated and you know, there's, there's lots of it. So, so how do I actually do something about that? And I come from a background of visualizing data and sort of a big fan of that, but you know, the web is like, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's not easy uh, to deal with. And, and as an analyst who is gonna try to do this, it's, it's tricky. And, and you know, how do I, I can find lots of text, lots of web, page, web pages, but how do I actually do that? So I'll switch completely and say, has anybody seen this TV series, Homeland? You know, a few of you. So it's sort of a, a pretty cool TV series. I recommend it, actually. It's, it's very cool. Uh, and there is one, one person in this series is this woman, Carrie, who's an analyst, who is, you know, to make it interesting, she's a little bit of a wild person and sort of all kinds of problems and issues. But one piece in this series, they, they have this wall of hers where she's basically taken all these scraps around this person she's trying to track. And it's built this timeline. It doesn't show up perfectly here, but like 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, where she's really tried to pull together all the views of this person thereafter and try to understand this. Now, you know, do we all build these sort of models of understanding things? Probably not, and there are all kinds of different ways of doing it, but at some level, this is the sort of the, the level of the tools that we're having to deal with. And you sort of ask yourself, is there, is there a better way of analyzing sort of time and space and organizing things if you're trying to analyze patterns in the world that really matter? And I like to think that there are. So I don't know if you've um, seen this one before. Many of you probably have. I, we started sort of showing this around 20 years ago, and then nobody had. But maybe I, I, I will ask raising of hands. How many have seen this? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Mm. Good progress. So this is Napoleon marching on Moscow, 1812, big army uh, in, in Poland. And he marches, and as you can sort of follow this width of this line, the army gets smaller. He does something unique in Moscow that uh, very few people have done. He actually invades the city. Uh, I'm Swedish by background, and we tried a bunch of times. And you never get to Moscow, but <laughs> the, uh, the, you, you typically burn out here. He actually takes the city, but the problem is that the city is dead empty when he gets there, so there's no food, so they have to go back. And you know, by the time they come back, he's actually gone himself by the time they come back. What's sort of neat is that, and you can track the temperature, you can track time, all in you know, maybe six dimensions in one picture. So, and people get pretty excited about this picture and you know, call it the best visualization of data that was ever made. And you know, so that's pretty neat. Now, what's the problem? 
So the problem is that this was done in the 1830s by this guy, Charles Minard. He spent years producing it and, and you know, taking one event and trying to put that together. You should like to think, like, dude, if we're going to have like, years of people pull, pulling these things together, that's, that's, that's pretty hard. It's worth doing every now and then. But, um, so, so maybe we could do something better. So my sort of theory about this, or our theory, is that here's the world, and rapidly the most interesting place to observe the world is the web. And I love to get in front of people who control large sets of satellites around the world, or who have large sets of agents running around the world observing it, or whatever they have as a way to collect data, and just say, look, this is where the future is. And, and when we did that five years ago, those people who ran all those expensive satellites or whatever now may be, they were pretty upset, or they'd be like, Jesus, go away, don't, don't bug me. But, but they're sort of coming around to that this is probably the most interesting place to organize the world. But the, the problem is, of course, that this is sort of all organized for finding documents, not for doing analysis. So it's awesome at finding that one document, but it's not so great if I want to see the patterns, understand the trends, and find the anomalies. So now to do that, and, and you know, there's a gazillion ways you could analyze that, and I'm not going to make any claims of, of cutting or going at them all, but I'll talk a little bit about time, because that's what we're trying to do, recorded future, maybe it sort of implies in the, in the name. So time is tricky, and, and the way that time is sort of um, described and used in the web, it's sort of um, in human language. And the tricky part is, of course, that human language is, is a mess. Uh, you know, Barack Obama said yesterday that Hillary Clinton will be traveling to Haiti next week. So, to under, now this might be a, in, like a tough example, but you know, if you're, you know, and, and even as a human, you sort of, oh, what? And then if you're putting, writing software that's going to deal with this and 500,000 other patterns, this ends up being pretty tricky. Um, so, here he says this, you know, yesterday that was about this time period. And, you know, how do I make sure that I'm not applying the Barack Obama timestamp to the Hillary timestamp, like lots of ways that this could fall down. And we could talk for hours about this one, probably make you fall asleep six times. Uh, and now the issue with that if, is if I'm looking for that sort of text on the web, not only am I going to find, um, not only am I going to find these sort of text snippets and try to have, you know, do something out of that, I'm going to find a lot of them. So, one experiment that we were working on, we looked at the earthquake in Haiti, uh, you know, two years ago. We probably picked up, you know, tens of thousands of instances of that in just minutes. Just like as that was going down, just like whoops, as it sort of ripples through the web, and you get all these different mentions of that. So not only do you need to be able to sort of pick up these, these mentions and then be able to sort of take them apart and see Haiti, earthquake, you know, out of AP, a tweet, understand that it's actually the same natural disaster that we're talking about, that it's actually the same country. Haiti is a fairly easy country to deal with. Text-wise, there's others that are much worse, or maybe one refers to the city, another one to the country. Uh, be able to reconcile all of this back to one event that is an earthquake, and uh, you know, that has one location, the problem is probably that the natural disaster to begin with, it's, I like to use the example of the Fukushima earthquake in Japan, that, that by now we probably think about it as one earthquake. You know, in 10 years we'll definitely think about it as one earthquake. At the time it was probably 15 earthquakes. Where there was, you know, so, so there, these sort of things are real tricky to model and, and, and understand. But if you want to use the internet as, as an analytical source, you need to be able to do this. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can we actually do this, pick up this sort of text in real time, and then be able to take this apart and actually create data out of that. So then um, what I'll sort of switch to is to say, now, what could you actually do then? Uh, and I was trying to think of some, some examples, and I'll still have them in this sort of national security realm here today. And you can sort of extrapolate from there if, if, if you want to. So you know, this, this protest stuff seems to be going on uh, everywhere right now. I don't know if you, uh, oh, somebody starts laughing. That's terrible. Yeah, all right, oh, good. <laughs> The, uh, maybe somebody who knows Russian or something, but you know, when, where, when is the next protest? Uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, so, so we're in here, and I'm, I'm going to try to keep this extremely simple, but here is sort of in, in, in real time where there's protests going on in the world. 
the resolution makes it a little bit crammed here, but you pretty quickly see that there's some, some pretty hot spots around the world. You could sort of uh, make uh, yeah, more, more things sort of coming in here in real time. Uh, and there's plenty of other things going on in the world, but this is the stuff that sort of flows to the top, if you want, as the highest profile, highest, you know, in all kinds of different ways of, of protest. Um, you could sort of plan your itinerary on where to avoid and not to be and all of these sort of things. And you can see down here it says September 12 until September 26. So yeah, that's cool. But I'll say September 26 is much more interesting, isn't it? So let's say, you know, and so I never know what date it is. It's September 19th. Uh, so let's actually move this out to say, uh, you know, we'll, we'll jump to September 21st and actually say, look, I only want to see where there's planned protest going forward, where there might be, uh, you know, something, you know, in, in um, you know, an upcoming protest event, not something that is just happening right now, but where there's going to be a public protest in Benghazi on September 21st. Now that's interesting, when there's actually something around the corner, something I actually can do, do something about. So think about that. We could actually have everything mankind knew about the future sort of at my fingertips. And I could you know, dive into this one for hours, but we'll do another sort of sim similar sort of example and say, um, I don't know anybody, you know, you're sort of laughing at my, my prior picture here, I don't know, the same reaction to this. Anybody know what this is? This is a place that America should care a lot about, or sort of we should know more. Maybe this is a dangerous place, Waziristan, northern Waziristan, um, sort of a really tough place. And obviously, you know, they live pretty, in a pretty tough spot, probably. So here's where the, the Masuds and the, the, uh, a couple of other interesting, the interesting groups hang out. And, you know, it's a pretty tough spot spot to understand what's going on there, and you could see, even if you're sort of walking around observing, it's not exactly what you'd like to hang out. So how could we get a sense of uh, what's going to go on there? So um, uh, we could say, look, I'm interested in Waziristan. Let's make sure that I spell it right here. Um, and it turns out that there's actually a fair amount of sort of activity going on what's going to happen in, in Waziristan. So let's, uh, we could look at that you know, map which might be interesting, but actually let's, let's look at a timeline of what's gonna go on in, in Waziristan. And, and it turns out that activity involving Imran Khan, I don't know if you have Imran Khan, we could dive into him here, and we'll do that maybe in a second. He's a ex-cricket player in Pakistan who is now a parliamentary uh, guy. And he's gonna go to do a big rally in Waziristan, October 6th, 7th. And, and one problem here is, if you know Waziristan is, or read about this, is that we operate lots of stuff there, if you believe the newspapers, that tends to shoot things down. And uh, so if you're a policymaker here, this, or, or an exec execution guy, this, this could be pr pretty problematic. Um, Waziristan here, the 24th, uh, going on. So let's, in fact, take a look at this Imran Khan guy. And, and it turns out that he also has a whole set of activities going on. So now you might say, you know, what about him? Let's look at the social network of, of Imran Khan in this time period. You know, who's involved with him? And you see this Ansula Azan, and it turns out that he's a pretty interesting guy. And we will kill Khan if he arrived. Um, pretty interesting sort of stuff here that, that if you think about how in the old days, you'd have to operate sat satellites. You'd have to operate agents on the ground. You'd have to operate a lot of stuff. This can really be available to sort of anyone, if you want, right at your fingertips in real time. So um, and the, sort of the neat thing is that this is not, obviously, I've sort of picked some extreme examples, because that's where I tend to think about violence and cyber attacks. But, this could be applied to supply chains and financial instruments and financial risk and product opportunities, sales opportunities, what's my competitors doing? Lots of actually much more accessible areas. So uh, with that, um, I think the, the point that I'll try to make is that maybe next time it doesn't have to be really that much out of the blue. It actually could be, uh, if not, not sort of predicted to the point, we can at least inform ourselves more about what's coming down the pipe and try to be smarter. So questions?
clearly really fascinating stuff that you have there. I was struck, though, by that first example that you used, the attack on Benghazi. That attack, as far as we know, as much as we know right now, was likely due to political movement allied with al-Qaeda that's trying to destabilize Libya. I suspect that those guys left no tracks on the internet, and didn't tweet that they were going to attack, didn't have a website, didn't have a meetup, wasn't running a wiki page on it. Um, so that that's in particular an example where this technology is sort of least able to help as opposed to areas where much more of the information is, is likely to be shared. And then as a related question, you notice one of the tweets you showed on the PowerPoint about two slides later was actually a tweet for a pro-government demonstration, sure. which of course, I'm, I'm not sure if the software is to the point now where it can distinguish between elements trying to destabilize the government because they wish to install an Islamic caliphate and elements in favor of uh, a Libyan democracy, which seems to me that that distinction is incredibly important, and I'm not sure that the, the software that you showed is sort of at a state where it's going to help policymakers understand the difference as opposed to just, well, it's protest. And no, no, that, those are that's great uh, two points. So you've thought about this before. So number one, if, if you were, you know, to, to your first point, that could be argued, and we could argue that at length. Uh, what the, and unfortunately, people have made politics out of that, which I think is crazy. But you know, put that aside, whether that's politically right or wrong. Uh, the, then the, so you're right, bad guys tend to be pretty careful about those sort of things. But, uh, and is the truth about really difficult stuff just laying out in front of you in a tweet, let's go do this secret stuff tomorrow? No, it's not that simple. The, and of course, you're looking for actually enabling a really smart human here to be able to pick together multiple signals that actually might lead to something. And I think here, the, there's two points to that. One is that there was a backdrop of increased violence here. And in fact, even if this was the case exactly as you said it, that it was a specific group who had planned an activity, let's assume that that was the case, they took advantage of something here. The stuff that happened in Egypt happened hours ahead of this. They, even if it was planned, they took advantage of something. There was a backdrop here that should have gotten somebody at State Department or something similar to say, we need to have more security at these locations. That's number one. And then number two, you write that it, let's assume that the, most, the, that the real secret stuff in that case is not going to be on the internet. That's true. But what's to say that the guy who actually is doing this in, in the secret environment can't pair up what's in the open with what's in the closed? That's actually where the juicy stuff happens. And that's actually in data analysis and in general, pairing up data sets. That's when interesting things happen. So this is what, you know, you're seeing half, half part of the coin here, I think, is the, the, the piece to make. The, now, of course, I forgot your other question. Uh, what was your other? Oh, yeah, yeah. So again, I think that's actually part of it, though, that there's, you know, the, that, that there's all kinds of dynamics going on in, in a country here. And these are complex places. There's probably like 16 different angles of, of people being angry in various sort of ways in Libya. And that's part of it. And do we have an automatic classification of, you know, one of these 16, no, we don't. The, the, and here it's sort of, you know, help the analyst to take that in who can start classifying that data. And now you could sort of, with sort of very sort of sentiment analysis, try to group things, but it becomes very difficult to, to do that. And especially if you're gonna do that in Arabic, we actually do pick up these things in Arabic and can do it in native language. But even so, that's not, not out of the box to do those sort of things. That's more about enabling the analyst to do that then. I had a, a follow-up question, too. Uh, in terms of uh, anal analyzing and predicting on these, these kinds of large social systems, generally these types of social systems have a great deal of fragility to them, and it creates very, dif very difficult issues in doing even roughly accurate prediction. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, as you've thought through your, an your, your analytics approach, if you can accommodate the fact that your different analysts who view this oftentimes impose a view which actually restricts their understanding of the data, have, have, have you come up with some methods to kind of empirically get around that and deal with the problem of the fragile system? Yeah, I, I think that's true in all analysis. And you, know, you can even go to the CIA website and download a book about analytic frameworks from the 60s that is awesome on the subject. And getting out of your own bias is sort of step page one in that book, I think. So I think that's true in all analysis, and not just in this sort of intelligence analysis. It's true in all analysis, that we tend to sort of 
get ourselves caught up in what I already knew. And, and what we hope to do here is to surface more data. That's more maybe the blunt sort of get more data in front of the person, get data in front of a person that is not just that standard report that they get from, from left and sort of read that and then apply their bias and pass it on to the next guy. Uh, so I think we can sort of get other kinds of signals in the hands of the people who need to see them. Um, but is there a, a foolproof way to avoid people to apply their own bias? No, that's, you know, somebody else is gonna have to fight that battle. I think it's the, that's, that's not my battle to fight. Comment on uh, how outlier analysis weighs in on your, in some of your metrics. Yeah, so so we've done um, so it's sort of different how you do this. You know, you you might be looking for things where there is just very little data volume, and and you know you're essentially just going to put all the data if you want in front of somebody. But then there's other sort of things like we we we've done things to monitor for protests in South America, and the joke is that in Santiago de Chile they've been you know protesting every day since you know 1970 or something like that. So so then you can actually start de developing some statistical models and in actually looking at you know breakout levels from from the mo from the base and and you know so so we've done some cool analysis on that actually and have operational systems going where where we not just like sort of presenting the data, but looking at you know elevation levels and, and using sort of statistical SPC-like models, I'd call it, to, to do that. And yes, so that can be done. Sorry, one quick question. Um, so looking at the future obviously is very valuable, but I'm wondering if looking at the past is actually more valuable. Um, trying to solve because these are you know there are problems that people don't know the answers to that they that have happened. Um, have you have you used the system to sort of look back at? I'm sure. thinking you know look, solving crimes or, or have, understanding global warming or whatever those kind of things. We have extremely sophisticated clients who are in the commercial world actually who, for example, would like to take uh, here is how information got out in the world and sort of roll it back. And then pair that up, as it goes back to your prior question here before, pair that up with what we knew about who, who should have known what at what time. And then say, if these, this set of people knew this information, how could these other guys know this at the same time? And then actually be able to infer who was the leaker. So information leakage and, and IP protection sort of issues that a lot of people worry about this these days is, now let's do a more trivial example. We've done a lot of blogging for fun about iPhones and clearly when you look at like the iPhone release dates, you'd be sort of a fool if you wouldn't go back and look at, you know, when does Apple typically release device X versus device Y and so yes, correct. Go back and, and, and look at, you know, so if you're looking at what's happening in Waziristan in September, let's compare to what happened in August. Let's look at last September. Let's look at all Septembers in Waziristan. So, by all means, and, and in fact, many times that's probably more interesting as a start rather than just sort of hoping for that fantastic glimpse in, into the future just lying in front of you. So that's a great point. It's, we, we'd like to think, right, we've, we've done things like before uh, January 25 in Egypt, go back to December of 2010 before things broke out in Egypt and say, who said things in December 10, or I'm sorry, December of 2010 that actually came true? And who said things that was completely BS, you know, that we should never, ever listen to again, you know? So you could use this as source validation. There's lots of reasons you want to go. It's not as sexy maybe to say it that way, but there's probably 80% of the, <laughs> the analysis goes that way, so. Uh, do you have anything on your technology stack that you use you could share with us and also maybe any comments about your favorite data sources for this sort of work? Yeah, good. So, so you know, um, it's actually a lot of uh, over, it runs at Amazon. We suck in sort of a wide set of news sources with our own crawling, news blogs, all this sort of stuff. We use DataSift, cool company, to get us access to Twitter in a neat way, uh, and, and, uh, and Facebook public groups and these sort of things. So it all comes in. Uh, we've written most of our own linguistics. We work with some friends up at Basis to do some of the basic entity extraction, uh, Boston-based company. Uh, use some other th things for that. Then all the temporal extraction we do ourselves and the finding the events so there will be a military maneuver in North Korea on Friday. The, those sort of things we do ourselves. 
We database this in MongoDB, so it's, we have a database probably of seven, eight billion dollars, eh, eight billion dollars, eight billion events in total, and then we shove this out on UIs in real time, as well as we have hedge funds who pick this up from our APIs and then in real time trade this on, on either individual events or on aggregates where we sort of help, help them sort of organize the S&P 500 in various sort of ways to find things to, sh to hold and short over the next, you know, everything from 30 minutes to 24 hours. So. Give you all the secrets. <laughs> Two minutes. Uh, have you done any uh, analysis of the reliability of these uh, predictions? Uh, because obviously there are a lot of uh, positive uh, results, but uh, did you count the false positives? Something like uh, astrologists, for example, hate yeah. to show. That's a great question, and, it, and the, the sort of the proof function is, is the hardest of all of this. You know, like what, is, what was actually true? So the good news with the stock market stuff that we've done is that there you can actually have a truth to come back to. So and you actually generate, lot, you know, so every 30 minutes you get the proof. Like, so I told you that these were the 40 names you should be long, and these are the 40 names you should be short over the next 29 minutes. All right, that's cool. And then, oh, right, wrong. And then just keep doing that for five years, first back testing, but then actually run it in real time and then overlay trading cost and overlay some more friction on that and da 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 da. Am I still making money for you? And you'll say, yes, you're correct. I don't care how you do it, but you make money for me. So then that's a nice example. Now, the really tough one is, of course, when will Iran get a nuclear weapon? Presumably, they never had a freaking nuclear weapon. So how can I actually say anything about whether this is interesting or not? So you, know, you have the, the, that sort of span. Um, we have a lot of people who use our software to do source analysis more than, and actually use it sort of as a hand, you know, they'll, they'll actually be in the system to develop and understand what sources are interesting or not. The, we were, we're working on trying to figure out how we can go back and get events that actually happened and overlay them and actually say what source was consistently the first to say when the new iPhone was going to be out, for example. Now, that's an easy one because it's pretty damn well defined. But you know, actually, right now, was it released on, what was it, September 12, or is it on September 21? What's the actual date? Now, you know, it's not too much to argue about. But a lot of these sort of political sort of events, they're obviously incredibly hard to say. When did they actually happen? Did they actually happen? Was there, you know, you could, there's, so it's so very tricky to, to do a lot of those sort of things. I've avoided your question maybe, but the simple answer is that there are some areas where you can do it, where you have the sort of the proof function, uh, and then there are some other ones where it's just really, really hard. So and you showed a lot of Twitter stream, but a lot of Twitter accounts are all fake, mm -hmm. and you may have people intentionally either trying to position history or to influence the future based on a whole host of tweets from accounts that have never tweeted before in the past, all consistently treating, t tweeting similar information that show a spike in a particular trend or things of that nature. You can imagine that that's one of the most common questions that we get. <laughs> We've gotten that question many, many, many times from people who are sort of uh, very paranoid and people who are sort of expecting to, so either in the intelligence community or in the financial community, who's sort of basically expecting that everybody's out to get them every second. And um, so my answer is typically that this will have you actually improve. You, I, I usually just start saying by, you are being manipulated. And, and then they say, that's correct, I am being manipulated. I can help you be less manipulated by actually allowing you to understand who's doing that. Um, we, you know, of course, we've taken all kinds of precautions and the sort of precautions you shouldn't talk about, but lots of sort of ways that we try to mitigate the more obvious stuff. But you know, hey, somebody could show up and hack the system. Somebody could put, put a, full, a false fact on the front page of the New York Times, and when we pick up that false fact on New York Times, that's a bad, you know, that will be bad. But on the other hand, if it's on the front page of the New York Times, you probably would want to know about it. Because actually, a lot of these things might actually have an effect on the world, even if they're false. So, Lots of different angles on that. We think that we actually improves people, improve people's ability to deal with being manipulated rather than the inverse. Cool, thank you. Thank you.